We are, we are very pleased uh, to have a speaker with us at lunch remotely uh, from the UK, uh, Lord Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England is joining us uh, by Zoom. Uh, and uh, the way we wanna do this today is have a fireside chat with Mervyn. Rob and I will lead that chat and you're welcome to join the conversation uh, after uh, we get through a few things. But we wanna talk about radical uncertainty and compound risk. And um, I thought I'd kick off the conversation. Mervyn, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. I've been enjoying watching you all have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and we're sorry that you couldn't join us, <laughs> not only for lunch, but for the proceedings this morning. Um, oh, I'm sorry about that too. In person. But uh, I think we've all learned a lot so far. We're going to learn a lot more now. Um, so I wanted to start by ask, by framing sort of three big questions. And the first is, how can we think more broadly about what, especially when there is more than one thing, um, can go wrong? That's the first question. The second is, what can guide us in a, in a world of true uncertainty when probabilities, and with all deference to all of us who do engage in this kind of thing, <laughs> when probabilities and models don't provide the answers? And the third question is, how can we modify the comfortable, maybe check the box approach, uh, rich risk register approach to thinking about compound risk? And I could eliminate the first one by talking, you know, we can refer to correlated risks and spillovers uh, and model and paradigm risks and all that. Um, you know, the second one we talked a little bit about uh, this morning, and this relates really to radical uncertainty, I think. And the third one relates to uh, something that Till Shoreman and his uh, colleagues talked about today is how do we think about stress testing, which is such a useful tool, but get away from making it cookie cutter or check the box? And how do we think about using it as a what if device? So those are the first three questions that we wanted to, uh, to address. Small questions. We're looking <laughs> to you for answers. So let me just take them in turn, but let me answer the first one and then you can come back with the second because I will have forgotten it by the time <laughs> we, we end the first. Certainly a lot of incredibly valuable work on analyzing the statistics of you know, outcomes which influence financial markets, the economy has been carried out by VRI. And I don't in any way want to you know, critique that at all. But I do want to give a somewhat different perspective on how we think about compound risks, particularly, you know, polycrises in the phrase of your conference. There are two points I'd make, I think. The first one is a fairly obvious point, which is that if you're dealing with polycrises or compound probabilities, the number of observations that you will have to calculate probabilities is significantly diminished. And therefore, I think it's very difficult to try to analyze some of these compound events in terms of probabilities when we just don't have the data on it. If you were to have asked the question you know, five years ago, what is the probability that within a three-year window or two-year window, really, we would have both a global pandemic and uh, a land war in Europe. I think people would have found it very hard to answer that question because some people would claim that they were experts on pandemics and other people would claim that they were experts on foreign policy and military interventions. And I think you'd have been just driven to the conclusion that you have to treat them as totally independent events. And... You know, there are there are compound events that maybe we can't treat in that way. So, you know, I think a dose of a big dose of salt about how far we can go in constructing probabilities is quite important. But the second point I'd make is a much more fundamental, which is that by treating risk as a statistical measure, I think you can go very badly wrong in understanding what is meant by risk. So what I mean by risk is 
that individuals or families or businesses or banks or even universities have what you can think of as a reference narrative. They have a view about the world in the next few years and their role in it, which is one that says, you know, on a reasonable path, we could expect to move in this direction. And the right question for them to ask is, what could derail that reference narrative? What could go badly wrong? And the point of asking that, that question is that if you ask the question, what could go badly wrong? First of all, you will not be reading from a long list of individual risks that are common to everyone to which you attach probabilities. You will be asking something specific about that individual business. So, you know, what could go badly wrong for a business like a theater or orchestra is that the building in which they perform burns down. That may not be a risk for lots of other people. And I think one of the great dangers of believing that we can measure risk solely in terms of statistics which are common to everyone and use that to price risk in the market and price financial instruments is that risk actually is different for different individuals. And what you really need to do is to say, what could go badly wrong you know, for my, my business, my enterprise, my family? And that, that if you do that, then I think you can um, home in on which compound probability, which collection of events is relevant to you rather than something which is a purely statistical phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I think that is you know fundamentally important. And you know, you mentioned earlier on the idea of risk registers. And the problem with risk registers is that each institution, there are two main problems with it. First of all, each institution says, well, there's a long list of risks that everyone writes down. We must have the same sort of list of risks. And secondly, that people are very nervous about putting something catastrophic in it because their view of a risk register is that they say, we've examined this, we've thought about it, we've asked someone in the organization to take responsibility for it. We the executive at the top or the board have done our bit. We've signed off on it. And if anything does go wrong, no one can blame us for not having put in place the bureaucratic measures needed to deal with it. I don't think that's terribly effective. And I think the trouble is there are so many events that you could imagine in the future. You've got to have a way, I think, a qualitative way, a narrative which says this is what we think could go badly wrong. And we need to have some plan, some idea of how we would deal with it, not pretend that we can analyze it in a precise quantitative way. I think a very good example of this is the misuse of models in the pandemic. We can come back to this, but the experts in pandemics were so keen to demonstrate that their models and statistical analyses would give us the answers that they exhibited a very high degree of hubris. Models of pandemics have been around for many decades, and the mathematics is you know, fairly sophisticated now. And this is helpful in understanding what a pandemic is. But if you're gonna apply the model and make forecasts, you need to have data on key parameters. When you suddenly find a new virus, you do not have that information. And it would have been much better if the model builders at the start of the pandemic particularly those in, in my country, the Imperial College Estimates in London, instead of saying, we've got a model of pandemics, we forecast that 500,000 people will die unless you close down society and the economy. What they should have said was, the key parameters that we need to know more about are things like the mortality rate from the virus. We don't know what that number is. And so we can't give you a precise quantitative forecast. But we can tell you that if you need to know what that number is, the best thing is that since you know the number of deaths, we think you should go out and carry out random samples of the population to find out how many people are actually suffering from the disease. So the whole strategy of testing should have been based not on this is our forecast for what will happen, 
but this is what we think we need to go out and discover more about in order to understand what might happen. And I think this hubristic application of models and quantitative forecasts is common to many <clears throat> sciences and social sciences. And it's why, you know, it's not just economic forecasts, but it was the very good example of the pandemic where you know, scientists too fell into the same trap. And it's very important not to do that, but to actually ask the question, what could go badly wrong? And what can we do in advance to try to make our society and economy more resilient and more robust with respect to what could go badly wrong. That's great. We heard a lot about that this morning. So what you're saying really echoes, I think, those things. Can you tell us in relation to that second question, which is what can guide us in a world of true uncertainty when models don't work? And what about what can we learn from your work on radical uncertainty in that regard to help tell us and help us help guide us in the things that we need to know? So I think there are a number of, of issues here. One is the use of models where it's very important, I think, to understand that models are very valuable, but they help you understand, give you some intuition about how the world works. What they're not good at doing is forecasting the future because the world is essentially non-stationary. You know, the scientists working on um, sending rockets to outer space can rely on the fact that the scientific laws that govern the behavior of rockets in space are, have been known for a long time. Therefore, they appear to be non-stationary and we understand them. Um, uh, there were certain aspects of engineering about rockets that we didn't fully understand, which led to explosions. But by and large, uh, you know, the direction in which rockets go can be programmed very accurately. That is not true of the economy, and it's not true of anything where human behavior comes into play. So the big challenge which people producing models of pandemics had was, you know, it, it's all very well to try to argue we understand something about the virus, we're learning more about it. But what do we understand about humans, how they would react to various measures of lockdown or reopening? We didn't. And therefore, I think we need to be much, rely much more on qualitative rather than quantitative statements about how we cope with uncertain future events. Um, and I, I think that's it, that's it, one very important lesson from this. So I'm attempted to say that common sense matters a great deal. You know, I think if you were to take another example of um, if you'd said 10 years ago, what's the probability of a rapid rise in the inflation rate? I think most economists would have said, you know, very low because we know what, how to manage inflation and we can keep it low. And we have models that explain it all. And yet when push came to shove, the fact that central banks decided in 2020 to engage in a large amount of quantitative easing, which is simply money printing, should have led people to realize that if the supply side of the economy contracts and central banks try to expand demand by printing lots of money, you get what in the old fashioned textbooks was called too much money chasing too few goods and you would get inflation. And it was the focus on one more modern development in economics of trying to think we understand the model, we understand what drives inflation that led people to abandon common sense. Common sense view, uh, both Larry Summers and I talked about this. You know, if you have a contraction of output in the economy, the last thing you want to do is to boost demand. And whether it was fiscal policy in the US or monetary policy around the world, including the US, there wasn't really any common sense argument for boosting demand when supply fell. The result was going to be inflation. That, so it, it, having an ability to talk about, to have a narrative about what your understanding of the economy is and what your response to a problem is seems to me absolutely vital. And the strange thing is that actually in academic life, when people want to argue, I've got a new idea or a new model, the first thing they do is to go to the coffee room 
and chat to their colleagues and have a narrative discussion about whether this idea makes any sense. And if it does, you go back to your office and then you write down the mathematics. But collectively, if we're trying to come up with policy responses to poly crises, I think you've got to have a, a plausible narrative where you're honest about what we don't know, as well as trying to explain what we do know. And that's not easy. And I don't think there is any formula for it. So, um, you know, the, the classic, um, you go to a bookstore in, the, in any airport, and you'll see lots of titles of books, like 10 lessons for the 21st century, 10 ways of making money, 10 ways of being happy. There are no simple you know, rules of thumb like that. There, are, there, are, there is a certain amount of wisdom you inherit, but basically what you need to rely on is learning from other people and using judgment. And in the end, good judgment is what differentiates, I think, a successful business, bank, government, policy from others. Rob, do you want to add anything to, uh, uh, to question Mervyn? Because after going through the sort of broad questions, I want to go to some more specific examples. Okay, well, I, I've been, uh, I went back and I've been looking at Radical Uncertainty, which is quite a fascinating book. It, it, um, it has a lot to say about exactly these questions, not, not surprisingly. For example, um, instead of recognizing radical uncertainty and adopting policies and strategies that will be robust to many alternative futures, Banks and businesses are run with reliance on models which claim knowledge of the future that we do not have and could never have. So there is, there is an underlying criticism of models uh, here and a suggestion of what to do about it, which is use a variety of models that envision different futures and design our policies to be robust to all of them. I hear that as a pitch for a compound risk. What do you think? Yes, and I think I, I don't want to be portrayed as someone who doesn't believe in models. I think the problem is that many models are misused. Um, you know, Tom Sargent describes a model as a probability distribution. <clears throat> I, I don't find that helpful. And I'll give you an example of a model that I think has been one of the most successful models in economics. And it's not a probability distribution. Back in the 19th century, David Ricardo came up with his theory of trade. And he put forward the proposition that if you're in a country, call it the US, he called it the UK, which is trading with a less developed country, which he called Portugal. And there are two commodities you could train, wine and, and wool. And the UK happens to be more productive at producing both of these. And he said, if you ask people, do you think it's worthwhile trading with a country that is actually worse at everything than you are? Most people's intuition is that can't possibly be sensible. You know, we're better at everything. Why would we benefit from trading with these people? And what David Ricardo did was to say, no, you think about it carefully. And he had a model with some numerical examples. You trade with people to exploit comparative advantage. So the fact that the UK was better at making both of these commodities didn't mean that they should make both. They should specialize in one in which they had a comparative advantage. This intuition from the model is now ingrained in the economics profession and indeed in much of politics. It's a very important insight, a crucial insight. If you look at what Ricardo actually wrote, the numbers he used for trade between England and Portugal had bore no relationship to any actual trade between England and Portugal. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. There was no question of probability. There was this fundamental insight that trade could benefit both parties. And this is very important in thinking about economic policy. There are lots of other examples like this. I mean, another step would be 
you know, lecture one in economics, um, price is determined by the intersection of supply and demand. And all this is very plausible. You go away, you understand it. And then you have, many years later, people working on information economics and pointing out that if one side of this market knows more about the quality of the good than the other side, you may find it impossible to get any equilibrium at all in the market. So these are crucial insights that we take to the world when thinking about policy, very important. But they're not dependent on having a probability distribution or writing down a precise um, model which you believe describes the world. You may need to write down a very complex mathematical model and it may be important to do that. I think the arrow de Brewer model of a competitive economy was fundamentally important. The maths was very difficult, and very complex. But Arrow and de Brewer did not say, this is a description of the US economy. They said, think about this for a moment and you'll realize how strong are the assumptions required for a free market economy to be efficient. And that enable people to try to focus on those areas where there were inefficiencies and improve them. So models are, I think, are very important, but what really matters is being able to think about these, these general questions. And I think this, you know, if, if the compound probability and compound risk is, is fundamental because most practical decisions that either policymakers in government or people in business have to take are, are unique about unique events. They face a problem that has never actually been faced before. Um, and, you know, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, no one thought of saying, you know, we've seen this happen 112 times before, and in 108 times, Russia beat Ukraine, and three times they lost. It just, it, that statement would make no sense. So you have to use the information you've got from the past, including quantitative information, to think about this particular problem that you're confronted with. And I think that when we think about risk, what John Kay and I in our book thought about was the idea that the, the big difference between the way we think about it and the way much of finance theory thinks about it is that finance theory thinks that Risk is, the, is a, a, an objective market thing, which is the same for everyone. So you can use that to price financial instruments. Uh, and it, then you really, I think, end up by saying that, you know, risk is very much about volatility. And we think risk is not about volatility. It's about each individual saying what could go badly wrong for us. And how do we think about, you know, what could go badly wrong? And the answer to that is clearly individual specific. Um, you know, in a pandemic, if you are a company making um, personal protective equipment, you know, this is not a risk. This is a wonderful investment opportunity for the country as a whole. It is clearly a risk. But to try and put it all into a framework in which there are some objective probabilities and there is a well-defined model which we know is how the world works, I think is too constraining. And it, it means that we're not getting the most out of the quantitative analysis because the world is non-stationary. That doesn't mean that you can't use quantitative information. Right. It means that you should not believe you can just use it to make a, an extrapolation, a forecast of what will happen. <clears throat> So yes. if I could go to a specific example, one we all or many of us live through, Certainly you uh, and I and Rob uh, did, among others, the financial crisis. In 2005, um, you know, it seemed to many of us that, you know, bad things might be uh, on the horizon. Um, and that wasn't universally embraced. If anything, there were many indications that maybe bad things weren't likely to happen. But, um, you know, if we had more information at that point in time, is it the case that, you know, we probably wouldn't have made much better decisions, that we wouldn't have anticipated what was likely to go wrong? Um, even if we asked the question that you're saying is fundamental, what could go badly wrong? Uh, and because the world is dynamic and non-stationary, does that rule out the possibility that with more information, 
we wouldn't have more insight into what could go wrong? Well, I think it's a question of using judgment. So one of the things that I think went wrong was that a regulatory framework was based on the view that we know the risks of different kinds of assets in the bank banking balance sheet, and we can calibrate risk weights using you know, sophisticated measures, and we had lots and lots of risk weights to calibrate how much equity capital a bank should issue in order to reach some reasonable standard of safety so that it could absorb losses. And what we learned in 2007, when the financial crisis started, was that these risk weights, which had been based on very detailed analysis of the previous, say, 50 years, when there wasn't a financial crisis, turned out to be irrelevant when there was a crisis. Events had changed. And when one asset seemed to you know, yield very low returns, almost every other asset was doing the same thing. So the assumption about how correlated these assets were changed radically between the time when people measured the risks and the time when actually the risks materialized. And I think that there were, you know, a much simpler metric was a better predictor of which institutions would fail. Uh, if you just looked at simple leverage ratios, which I know that many people in finance don't like because the banks don't like, because they claim we, you know, if we've got a better managed and less risky portfolio of assets on our balance sheet, we should have to issue less ca equity capital. But the trouble is that these, these measures do not apply when there is a crisis because a crisis normally reflects something happening which wasn't properly anticipated and prepared for. And in that sense, the world is non-stationary. You know, the classic case in 2007 was the, um, the senior Goldman Sachs executive who said, you know, we, gosh, we're seeing 25 standard deviation events several days in a row, which is clearly an absurd statement because that it would mean, it, you know, the chance of that happening once, uh, it would be in sort of more years than the world has ever existed. And what he should have said was, was the risk models we've been using are wrong. You know, they may have been worked at some point in the past, they may have been helpful in the past, but they don't apply now. And therefore, we need to think in a different way. So the idea that you just accumulate more data and more information can be very dangerous. And another example is LTCM, which had a very large amount of high frequency data, which they used in order to try to work out whether they could buy and then sell two assets, which were very similar, but just slightly different, and exploit the difference in price between them. Well, what turned out was that the data set they had used had never included a period in which there was a major default of a large country, Russia, and the turmoil in financial markets that followed from it. So it is a question of being able to contemplate what could go badly wrong? What could derail the reference narrative? And they didn't ask that question at LTCM. And as a result, they were caught unaware. Um, and I think you know, it's, it's worrying about the big risks. And the big risks, as Rob said, are usually a mixture of things happening at the same time, compound risks. So uh, I, I like the way you're describing what's a useful thing to do, which is to learn from the past, but adaptively. And I think that's what the best models should do. And if you had models that were adjusting as new information comes in, they're more likely to be uh, relevant for the decisions you're trying to make. And I think you say that in here, you say, sensible, adaptive public policy and business strategy cannot be determined by quantitative assessments of policies and projects made by an industry of professional modelers using probabilistic reasoning. But it could be done by people who are not in this category, right? Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, so put it bluntly, <laughs> I don't think that the models that people are working with should be described as saying, 
this is what is going to happen. We can forecast the future. Right. Instead, people should say, you know, these are the models we've worked with. This is what we think we have learned from examining past data very carefully. This, therefore, are a set of issues that you in your business or government should worry about. Think about them and work out how you can make yourself resilient to them. So identifying what could go wrong is very important. And it's important to have a feel qualitative, quantitatively for that too. So, I mean, a, a simple example on a microeconomic level would be, um, you know, a, a government deciding whether or not to invest in a high-speed rail service, which we are trying to do, should ask itself the question, based on past experience, um, it's always been the case that the cost of a project has increased enormously from the initial estimates, partly because people who don't like the project object and the planning process takes forever and the whole thing gets delayed, partly because there is inflation and the cost rise. Have we really thought through ourselves? Do we have a really good feel for how big the benefits are to this project? And what are the benefits that don't normally enter into a traditional cost-benefit analysis. And quantitative data is very important for that. But a typical, a single model rarely captures all that. So what we need are people who can work with models but understand the limitations of their own model and don't sell it as something which it isn't. Um, and I think the danger, certainly in politics, and I suspect in much of business too, is that the people who have ultimately to make the decision are using modelers and forecasts, not necessarily to make that decision, but to justify the decision they've made on the grounds, well, we took the best advice, this is the best model. But as a result, they could be making very big mistakes. What you really want are people who will, uh, in a sense, interrogate the modelers and get different views and try and bring together the, the, the sort of qualitative cost benefit analysis informed by numbers where there are numbers, but realizing that there are some costs and benefits for which you can't easily produce numbers. Can we ask a question? You raised the issue of the land war in Europe. No. Obviously Russia's invasion of Ukraine was not something that was universally expected. But having seen that and having seen some of the consequences of it, can we learn from that to adapt our frameworks, our models of these issues to think about what might be next and what can go badly wrong? Well, it's very hard to think about putting this into a, a sort of quantitative model of who's going to invade whom next. <laughs> uh, I think the... If you asked a question, you know, what could go badly wrong here, then and I find this missing in, the, in much of the current political debate, though I'm sure it's being discussed behind the scenes. But the consequence of the invasion for many ordinary people in the West was to see quite a shock, certainly in Europe, was a large increase in food and energy prices, which depressed their standard of living. And politicians were rather reluctant to have a simple narrative that said to people, we have decided to support Ukraine. We think this is the right thing to do. We think you think this is the right thing to do as well. You see that because of the willingness of people to take in refugees and help people. But we have to be very conscious that this is gonna reduce our national standard of living. We can have a debate about how we share that both within the current population and across the generations. But nevertheless, that is going to be one of the outcomes. And without that sort of conscious acceptance that something has gone wrong, but we have recognized it, we're willing to pay that price. The risk now, I think, is that it, it's going to be you know, difficult to raise that argument for the first time one year, two years from now, if the conflict is still continuing. And no one has really asked the question, you know, 
How do we see this? I mean, in the public debate, how do we see this coming to an end? And when you talk to people who think hard about these issues, whether in government or outside privately, it, no one really has a good feel for it. And the, the challenge facing us is that you know, this is not like um, the Second World War, where the competents knew that they would have to continue fighting until the end, one way or another. And um, is it true? That, I mean, Ukraine can only carry on now with Western support, but we're not prepared to intervene ourselves, and we're not prepared to give them the military support that would enable them to defeat Russia. So we, we're, we're sort of walking a tightrope where we're trying to think about what weapons you can give Ukraine, which enables itself to defend its borders, but not actually destroy things in Russia. But we're getting to the point where there is no agreement now on what those borders are. Ukraine has been um, emboldened to say it wants to go right back and reclaim Crimea. Uh, what is our view on that? What are the risks that could follow for an, an attempt to push Russia out of Ukraine? What are the risks from not saying clearly to the Ukrainians you will have to accept that Crimea has gone to Russia. Um, these are questions to which I don't think looking at past data is of any real help. I think you can look back at what Russia has done in respect of Georgia and in Crimea. You can look back to Russian history. Um, you can learn from the past, but nobody I think in their right mind would think that the right approach to this is to say, you know what, there's a 10% chance that Ukraine could defeat Russia, 30% chance it could push them out of Crimea. What, what help would it be to have those numbers? I don't think it would. There are judgments involved in what we're prepared to do, and most importantly, how far Western populations are willing to continue providing the, the resources to enable Ukraine to continue. And how many people who've left Ukraine, somewhere like 15% of the population will want to go back. But these are just enormously difficult questions. Um, and they are of classic examples of compound risks because you can't really discuss any aspect of the Ukrainian crisis without thinking about all of these things, the military dimension, what weapons are Russian prepared to use? What are we gonna supply? What do the Ukrainians want? Will the people have left Ukraine? Will they go back? All of these are, you know, to think about a scenario, it's a mixture of all these different events. And I think, you know, scenario analysis, you know, I was fairly skeptical of it in the past because whenever you talked about scenarios, people always concluded by saying, so which of these three scenarios do you think will happen? And of course, the right answer is none of them. <laughs> That's not the point. The point of scenario analysis is to make you understand that there are, it's, there are a whole complex web of things that could occur. Um, not to say, well, you've got a choice between three things. And I do think that thinking about scenarios is a useful way to try and handle compound probabilities and events. Thank you. Um, Mervyn, I think that um, this has really been great. Uh, as I said before, it echoes a lot of the things that we've been talking about this morning. I just want to see if there are uh, any questions from the audience before we before we conclude. And I'm going to call on Wilson, and let me see if there are any others, and Don Cohn. So Wilson first. So Mervyn, great to see you. Um, last eight weeks have been an interesting week. Set of uh... Can you speak up? It's not coming across to me, the sound. Mervyn, it's great to see you. Uh, you? The, last, the last eight weeks have been a pretty interesting period in finance. Do you have any observation on how the first failure of GSIB and the fastest bank run in history both were handled uh, by the official yeah. sector? And any things that you'd be doing to think about what could we do better going forward? Well, I, I've written about that and I can talk for ages about it, but I'll just make a couple of points. I think that the worry that I have about these things, and it reflects to our general discussion here, 
is that the authorities were making things up as they went along over a weekend. That is never a very good position to be in. Um, banks are inherently fragile because there can be a bank run, even on a perfectly sound bank, if enough people believe a rumor that it may fail. So you've got to have a, a, a mechanism for ensuring that banks do have access to liquidity when they suddenly and unexpectedly need it. The only source of liquidity, in my view, in a crisis is the central bank. And I think we need a proper ex-ante framework, which would apply to any uh, event in which a bank suddenly found itself subject to a run. And what I find intriguing is that in the financial crisis, which we spent a lot of time analyzing and dealing with, people weren't worrying so much about deposits in that crisis. They were worrying about wholesale funding, short run wholesale funding that was not being rolled over. Recent episode, it's about deposits. But what's it, the, the common theme here is any short run runnable liability that could disappear. And you need a common framework for dealing with it. So I don't think the, it, it, the solution is about deposit insurance. It's about having a coherent framework. And in my 2016 book, the scheme that I call the pawn broker for all seasons, I think central banks are gradually moving towards that de facto. And I think we'll, you'll see more of that um, in the months and years to come. Mervyn, uh, I wonder if you would reflect a little bit on the policy committees that you served on and you and I served on together as their abilities to get at that what could go badly wrong. So I think there, I, I worry that uh, the Federal Open Market Committee, maybe the MPC, FPC, don't ask that question often enough. Now the FPC has the stress test started under your, your leadership and that's one way of doing it. But I, I, I wonder whether the discussions and the way the material feeds into the policy committees um, really get at, the, at your basic question of let's, let's talk about what could go badly wrong rather than just what the modal uh, outlook might be. Well, I think it's a good point. I, I think the, the policy committees have done quite a good job in making progress in that direction. Um, I mean, a good example, I think, is what you did on the FPC in identifying in 2018 the risk that pension funds might suddenly one day experience large cash margin calls and not have the cash to meet it. They had perfectly good assets against which they could borrow. The tragedy in a way is that the the Bank of England didn't really listen enough to its own financial policy committee and put in place a liquidity facility to which pension funds could apply. They just thought, well, we'll deal with it on the, when, it, when the problem happens, we'll deal with it. And I think that was the problem in the big financial crisis as well. People thought, oh, you know, we'll find a way of handling it. And it's too late when that happened. And so in last September, you know, the, the bank executive wanted to deal with it with a liquidity facility but then discovered that since it wasn't put in place already, that the pension funds had governance restrictions that prevented them from applying for it quickly and doing something overnight or in the next couple of days. So, you know, the policy committee, the financial policy committee was a very good way of ensuring people did actually ask the question, you know, what could go wrong here? And that, that's a success story. I think the difficulty with, with, with it is that any official committee that has to explain what it's doing and talk about things to the, the world at large feels very nervous about trying to identify something that could go very badly wrong. Because the question then is, if you say, and we had this problem before the financial crisis, when the Bank of England published its financial stability reports, but actually had no power to do anything about it. And we couldn't easily write a report that said, you know, we think there are real big risks here because the obvious question of a reader of our report was, okay, so if you think it's a big risk, what are you going to do about it? And the answer was, we were not in a position to do anything about it. And I, I think, therefore, that the pressure on policy committees 
even more on politicians is to try not to be open about what could go badly wrong. And, you know, if you were to, I remember trying very hard to persuade Boris Johnson that he ought to give a speech where he explained that the invasion of Ukraine had reduced our national standard of living. And he was all in favor of giving a speech, but he didn't want to give any bad news. So basically, the, the only speech you could give had good news. That's not the point of identifying risk. The point of identifying risks is to say, and we are preparing a way of handling it or mitigating it, and that is the good news. Now, we thought about it, and the good news is that we think we can mitigate it, but not prevent it. Um, so, you know, I think the Financial Policy Committee has actually done a reasonable job at this, uh, not least because of your presence on it, but I think... It, somehow the public debate needs to have more attention paying to that. Um, what's your thought? <laughs> it's easy for me to agree on the financial policy committee, right? <laughs> but I, I, I actually, my mind was on uh, as much on the monetary policy committee and the FOMC. So was there somebody in the FOMC in the middle of 2021 saying, this stuff might not be transitory. If it isn't transitory, what's our plan? And I don't have a sense that that was happening. It's not reflected in the minutes or something. I mean, I don't have the transcripts. And I wonder this sort of the same thing about the monetary policy committee I think, that so I think that is absolutely correct. And I find the odd thing about it is that the argument originally given for involving more academics into monetary policy decision was to challenge the groupthink yeah. of the official world, the, the bureaucrats in central banks. They've got a fixed mindset. In the 1930s, this was called the treasury orthodoxy or the treasury view. And it needs to be challenged. The bizarre thing about what happened in 2020, 21 was that the group think came from the academics and they had adopted a theory of inflation that said they knew how inflation was determined. It was driven entirely by expectations. There are some short run movements, inflation up and down. But in the medium term, inflation was bound to come back to 2% because that was the target. And that's embodied in the model that the central banks were using to make forecasts. What was needed was for someone to say in 2020, why are we doing the QE? And the initial answer was because we saw the dislocation in financial markets, US treasuries and so on in March 2020. But that same person should have said, okay, but actually it's now July 2020. The dislocation has gone away. Why aren't we unwinding the purchases of assets? Why are we doing a whole lot more? And the answer would have come, well, we don't really know how QE works, but it seems to be a good idea. And we've got to demonstrate to people that we're supporting the economy. And that that needed to be challenged in two ways. One, that the pandemic is reducing the supply potential of the economy temporarily. Why on earth are we trying to boost demand? If you're trying to boost demand when supply is falling, that doesn't seem to be a very sensible thing to do. Uh, and secondly, the money supply is growing at the fastest rate in US history. You don't have to be a monetarist to ask the question, you know, don't we think we should ask what is happening? What, what does this mean? You know, Alan Greenspan would have, you know, he wouldn't have said, oh, I'm a monetarist. I know that this growth of money supply means inflation is going to go to 6.3% or whatever. But he would look at all the data and he would say, what is the narrative? What's going on in the economy here? We have to understand why it's growing that quickly. And he would quickly, I'm sure, have come to the conclusion that this was not really the moment to boost demand when supply has fallen. That was a common sense argument. And I think the mistake was that the group think um, and it's still there in many central banks and economists trying to defend it. The group think meant that they stuck to their one model and lost touch with common sense. And it, 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 there should have been someone on a policy committee who said, look, you know, I'm not an economist, but I'm worried about what's happening. 
what it ha try to convince me that I think it is that I should believe it's a good idea to boost demand when supply is falling, or that I shouldn't worry that money is growing at 25% a year. And that was never put to people. And I think these these simple questions are very important. One of the most important, one of the best members of our monetary policy committee was someone who wasn't an economist, but was totally unafraid of asking basic questions that no economist was prepared to ask because it might have revealed that they didn't understand the latest theory. Um, and someone who's willing to ask those questions is, is very important on the committee. I agree. I mean, I think there was a tendency to fight the last war. The last war was the global financial crisis. Yep. That was a, a terrible demand shock. And it, and the recovery was very slow. So let's just throw everything at the demand side without thinking about yeah. the supply side. I agree. But the crucial thing in any situation where you've got a big problem is to say, what is going on here? What is happening? It, you know, you can't just say, oh, you've got some models and a team of staff will tell us what to do. You've really got to, what is going on here? And what was going on in 2020 was completely different from what was going on in the global financial crisis. Irvin, thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure. Well, I'm sorry I haven't been able to enjoy your lunch, but um, next time I come over, I, I hope you'll give me lunch. <laughs> we absolutely will. Splendid. Thank you very much, and good luck to the rest of the go. conference.